This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. He may be virtually unknown in the West, but the Persian thinker Avicenna, who was born in around 980 in what is now Uzbekistan, is one of the most important philosophers in history. That, at least, is the view of Avicenna expert Peter Adamson. A polymath, Avicenna wrote about everything from music and physics to theology and astronomy to logic and medicine. He also came up with what he regarded as an incontrovertible proof for the existence of God. Peter Adamson, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Hello there. We're going to focus on a particular philosopher from the Arabic world, Avicenna. Could you just say a little bit about who he was? He lived in the 10th and 11th centuries AD, and he lived and traveled around in the Middle East, modern day Iran, and he was of Persian extraction, but wrote most of his works in Arabic. He's the greatest figure in the history of Islamic philosophy because he's very innovative and because he's an innovator in many different fields. For example, he's also a, an important figure in the history of medicine. I know you think his ideas are worth studying not just as a historical relic, but actually because they have powerful arguments within them. Could you perhaps outline his most famous argument for the existence of God? To do that, I need to first explain his conception of how modality works. So what I mean by modality is the concepts of necessity, possibility, and impossibility. He has a famous distinction, which is the essence-existence distinction. And this seems to be original with him, although it's inspired by various things in Aristotle. So here's the distinction. If you consider the essence of something, so consider, for example, the essence of your computer on which you're listening to this, the essence of your computer, in other words, the nature or definition of what it is, does not tell you that the computer must exist you can verify this for yourself by throwing it out the window, at which point it will cease to exist. However, obviously it can exist, right, because it's working right now. So what that tells you is that, as Avicenna might put it, its essence is neutral with respect to existence. Sometimes he says it does not deserve to exist on its own merits. Now, if you contrast to that something like a round square... The essence of a round square clearly guarantees that it doesn't exist. If you just look at the definition, you'll see that it must be both round and square, which is not going to happen. And that is what Avicenna thinks of as impossibility. So that gives you impossibility, possibility. The concept of necessity would be explained in the same way. The essence of something necessary is an essence or a definition which will guarantee that the thing exists. And the point of Avicenna's argument for the existence of God is to show that there is such a being. In other words, there is a necessary being, and that's God. So how do you move from possibility to necessity? Right, okay, well, let's stay with our example of the computer. The computer is a possible existent, and that means that its essence doesn't guarantee that it exists or that it doesn't exist. The computer does exist, so what do we need in order to explain the fact that the computer exists? Well, we need a cause, and the cause will be something outside of the computer. That sounds uncontroversial. Okay, so we've moved from something possible exists to understanding there must have been a cause for it existing. That's straightforward. Absolutely. So in particular, it looks like computer technicians are not going to be admitted to be God just because they made the computer exist. So what we're going to get is a chain of causes. Each member of the chain will be merely possible, or as we would now say, contingent. So then the question becomes, could there be a world where everything in the world was caused by something else and that other thing was merely contingent? And the answer, according to Avicenna, is no. But why couldn't you have an infinite regress of contingent causes? Exactly, that's the question. So a good way of thinking about this, I think, is think about your father, your father's father, and now pretend you don't believe in evolution. So could there be just fathers all the way back? It looks like every father would be contingent, but every father would be a sufficient cause for their son. The answer that Avicenna gives to this is that the entire set of contingent existence or entities will itself be contingent. Sometimes he's accused here of making a mistake. So this is sometimes called the fallacy of composition from the fact that every part of a clock is well designed. It doesn't follow that the clock is well designed, right? Because maybe the clock is put together terribly. 
But on the other hand, it's true that some properties carry over from parts to whole. So, for example, from the fact that every part of the clock is a physical object, it follows that the clock is a physical object. So the question is whether the set of all contingent entities is like that. In other words, does it follow from the fact that every member of the set of contingent entities is contingent, that the entire set as an object is contingent? And here Avicenna just says that it does follow, and obviously this is something one could dispute. <laughs> he then therefore says, let's consider the entire world. So let's in fact just use the word world for the set of contingent entities. The question will be, how did the world get there? And he'll say, well, it's a possible existent. That means that its essence neither prejudices us in favor of its existence or its non-existence. So we need a cause. Now let's think about the cause. Is the cause itself contingent? Well, no, because then it would just be another member of the set. It must be external to the set, this cause. And this cause will be a necessary existent, and that will be God. That's the proof. Even if I accept that, it doesn't tell me anything at all about the qualities that God has. That's a very good point, actually. In fact, it's a point that Avicenna is keenly aware of because what he does is he says, okay, that's the necessary existent. Now let's think about what the necessary existent is like. And then he tries to derive all of the standard divine attributes from the notion of necessity. So, for example, you might get a concept like omnipotence out of the fact that there's no other causal influence that's brought to bear on God, right? So he's purely causing and not at all caused. That's the sort of thing that he does. I mean, obviously it gets complicated because you need to do each divine attribute separately, but he thinks he can get them all out of the concept of necessity. So every divine attribute, omnipotence, omniscience, all the classic theists' attributes of God are, on his view, necessary features of God. They're not contingent features of God's That's character. Very, again, very well spotted because there's another controversial aspect of Avicenna's view. So it looks like what Avicenna is saying is that God's existence just necessitates the existence of all of the possible things. And in fact, he uses a bit of terminology here that I haven't brought in yet, but he uses it a lot, which is the distinction between the necessary in itself and the necessary through another. So God is necessary in himself. He's the only thing that's necessary in itself. And everything else that exists is necessary because of God. Now, what people don't like about this or what people criticize him for in the Muslim tradition is that this sounds very deterministic, right? So it sounds like the world must always exist. And the other problem is it looks sort of like the only things that could exist are the things that do exist. God necessitates all of the possible things and they become necessary. So there's a question here about whether there are some possibilities lingering that were genuinely possible but were not actualized by God. That's another difficult problem. But in any case, there does seem to be room for a worry here, which is that it looks like the whole process is very automatic. So even though Avicenna says that this act of creation, and he does call it creation, is also an act of generosity, you might look at it and say, well, he's not really entitled to that. It looks more like it's just an automatic relationship between the necessary and the possible. Everything about God is necessary. And once you've got God, you've got the world. If God's existence and character are all defined by necessity, God doesn't choose to do anything. So God has no free will. Attributes like generosity are misplaced because mm-hmm. God just has to do what God has to do. Yeah, this is exactly the sort of thing people said about Avicenna. But he, I think he would have a good response, which is to say this. Well, it sounds like what you're asking for is that we envision a God who's merely possible. Because what you want is you want God to have chosen to be the way he is or to do the things that he does. So let's entertain the thought that God is merely possible, at least in some respects. Well, wait a minute. Isn't the possible that which requires a cause for its actualization? Uh Uh-oh. It looks like now we need a cause for God. So either we've made a mistake here or this thing that we were considering that's supposed to be so providential and so on wasn't God. So Avicenna thinks that it follows from that that you need to come to an understanding of how things like generosity could be compatible with necessity. And of course, he's not alone in this. A lot of theologians would agree with this because as much as we might want God to be generous, loving creator, we might also want to guard against the thought that God just happens to exist or just is contingently the way he is. Now, you've outlined this 
quite complex argument, very clearly, actually. Do you personally take this to be a proof of God's existence? So I think it's an attempted proof. I don't think there are any knockdown proofs for God's existence. It has in common with the ontological argument that everyone tends to find it fishy, but no one's very confident about where the problem is. So what might be wrong with this argument? Well, a lot of the work is being done with his analysis of what it means for something to be possible. And you might just reject that. You might say that some possibilities could be realized just as brute facts and that there is no further explanation for that. I mean, you seem to agree that it's very intuitive and kind of uncontroversial that possibilities won't be realized unless there's a cause. But actually, it's not that clear that that's the case. I mean, you might say, well, it was possible that the world exists, and lo and behold, it does. End of story. So that would be a very quick way of defeating the argument. I think also there are worries about whether it's really true that the set of contingent things is itself contingent, and there are also worries about the internal structure of the set of contingent things. So is it really true that causation can't be circular, for example? Maybe it can, in which case you don't need to postulate a necessary existent. And the other thing, maybe the most important thing to say, is that even if you believe that there's a necessary existent, you would then have to buy into all of Avicenna's arguments trying to derive the divine attributes out of the notion of a necessary existent. And in fact, those arguments are pretty weak. So you might say, well, I believe there is a necessary existent, but it's not the traditional god of theism. Nevertheless, Avicenna has been incredibly influential. Could you say something about how his influence has spread? Avicenna is unique in that he's the only philosopher from the Muslim world who's both very influential in the Christian West and in the Muslim worlds. In fact, he's so influential that I think that it makes sense to think about the story of philosophy in Arabic as a pre avicennan period where people were responding directly to the Greek tradition and the post avicennan period where people were responding to Avicenna whether they liked him or not. And in fact, although obviously his influence in Western philosophy tails off once you get past the medieval scholastic era, in the Muslim world, people still read Avicenna and read philosophers who wrote in the Avicenna tradition down to this day. So in terms of influence, he's probably one of the five most influential philosophers in history. Why then is he so rarely studied in Britain? Good question. <laughs> well, I guess the short answer to that would be that I'm trying to remedy that. Peter Adamson, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.